Hi everybody, welcome to this Timeline documentary. My name is Dan Snow and here I am in a Lancaster bomber cockpit, one of the few remaining Lancasters from the Second World War, to tell you about my new history channel. It's called History Hit, it's like Netflix for history. Hundreds of history documentaries on there and interviews with many of the world's best historians. Follow the information below this film or just search online for History Hit and make sure you use the code TIMELINE to get a special introductory offer. Now enjoy this show. Total war is all encompassing. A war without boundary or limitation. In the Second World War, massive armies advanced, confronting whole populations with impossible choices. The manufacture of weapons transformed industry and the workforce. Area bombing campaigns reduced cities to rubble. Sieges doomed populations to starvation. Racial policies sponsored campaigns of genocide. At the heart of this conflict were ordinary people who would reveal both the best and worst of humanity. People whose lives were lost or mortgaged to the demands of total war. In the peace that followed the First World War, people across the globe, raw and grieving, hoped it had been the war to end all wars. But a far more destructive war lay in their not too distant future. In the 1920s and 30s, the fragile peace began to falter. The Abyssinian crisis, the Sino-Japanese war, and the Spanish Civil War, each in their own way, provided glimpses of the war to come. The nature of war had been shifting from limited warfare towards total war for many years. Military scholars and philosophers sought a way to describe this new kind of warfare. In the 1820s, the influential Prussian general and military scholar Karl von Clausewitz developed his concept of absolute war. In his mind, an absolute war was a war where there was an unlimited political objective. The entire destruction of the enemy's state, if necessary, the total eradication of their independence. Von Clausewitz thought absolute war was unlikely. He thought the strain it would place on societies would cause them to collapse. But of course, he had not foreseen the development of enormous nation states by the turn of the 20th century. Von Clausewitz's theory of absolute war anticipated some of the realities of war almost 100 years after he wrote it. But when the First World War introduced the world to warfare dominated by the industrial strength of the combatants, it was far more destructive than anything von Clausewitz could have imagined. like nothing we've ever seen before in war, and so are the casualties that follow. But it's more than just the armies, it's about how economies are mobilised. For the first time you have major command economies in Europe, where the government directs the production to support the war effort. There's a huge change in how society approaches the creation of economic wealth. General Erich Ludendorff, nominally German First Quartermaster General and effectively overall commander, dubbed the new kind of conflict, total war. It was the First World War that alerted Ludendorff and others to the possibilities of total war. But it was the Second World War that would demonstrate its catastrophic potential. 
Second World War fits the idea of a total war even more so than the first. Whereas in the First World War, the states, although well developed and able to put millions into the field, lacked certain features that the Second World War states have. In the Second World War, you have clearly totalitarian states, Nazi Germany, Soviet Russia, even Imperial Japan, who can mobilize their populations on a level never seen before. Total War encompassed different dimensions. Elements of total war were to do with the level of technology and destruction that was deployed in military action. Others were to do with the way in which civilians were exposed to violence. And different countries engaged in different aspects of that total war to different extents. Exposure to the different aspects of total war would depend on time and place. When the war ended, the cities of the United States were intact. Those of Germany, in ruins. Both Germany and Australia were combatants. But the degree to which those living in each country experienced total war varied immensely. The citizens of Dresden saw their city destroyed. The people of Melbourne, were untouched. The extent to which war dominated the economies of each country committed to the war effort also varied. Germany, for example, actually didn't mobilize its economy very effectively in a total way until relatively late in the war. Britain started that process much earlier. The most complete mobilization of the home front was in the Soviet Union, where the true nature of total war was made clear by the German invasion. It was a struggle for existence, and a society had to go all in. Right from the beginning, if you endorse the notion of total war, you're breaking down restrictions on the kind of means that can be used to achieve victory. I think total war has several key features. It is a war that is seen as an existential struggle. The nations that are involved see it as a question of survival or annihilation. Any methods that are needed to win that struggle are considered to be legitimate. Total war did not emerge spontaneously. It evolved through the conflicts of the years between the wars, which included and gathered together elements of total war. With each conflict, people across the world became accustomed to, perhaps desensitized to, the unrestrained violence of total war. When the Second World War went global in 1941, millions of people would become embroiled in a struggle for total victory or total defeat. The origins of the commitment to total war and total defeat can be traced back to the armistice of 1918. The First World War ended on November the 11th, 1918, at least in the West, but in fact, fighting went on longer in, in the East. And I think that's something we should always remember. What happened then is that the leaders of the victorious allies had to meet and had to decide how to deal with what was a catastrophic situation in Europe. In 1919, Europe was chaotic. The great continental empires that had, for better or for worse, ruled over Europe, Habsburg, Hohenzollern, Romanov, Ottoman, were gone. The aftermath of the Great War had left parts of Europe starving. It had globalized and industrialized warfare on a scale never seen before. And then at Versailles, leaders from nearly 30 nations came together to establish the terms of the peace. I think that very much in their minds of those who went to the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 was to try and avert another catastrophe like the one they'd just come through. The peace at the end of the First World War was in many ways an illusion. The Treaty of Versailles, signed on the 28th of June 1919, was one of five treaties formulated in the Paris Peace Conference. The terms of the treaty were seen as unnecessarily harsh 
the War Guilt Clause, which placed the blame for the war squarely at German feet, had numerous toxic consequences. The payment of billions in reparations, the loss of territory and population, loss of all her colonies and restrictions on the size of the German army and on the creation of weapons and munitions among them. Versailles left a legacy of resentment in Germany that was to prove disastrously fertile. It was surprising how many people during the making of the Treaty of Versailles were looking forward and saying, well, the Germans are going to be, uh, they're going to be vengeful. There is going to be a new war in due course. Shocked by the severity of the terms, many Germans believed its punitive measures were unfair. The treaty became widely known as the Diktat. Another legacy of the loss that would have far-reaching consequences for the mobilization of the population for total war, and later insistence on total unconditional surrender, was the Dolchstosch Legenda, or Stabbed in the Back legend. The Stab in the Back myth was a belief that Germany had never actually been defeated in the First World War, that her armies were still in the field and, and, and hadn't been overthrown by the Allied armies, and that it was only those people at home, the socialists, the Jews, the, you know, the, the elements who were effectively against the state, who had brought Germany to a situation where they were forced to negotiate a peace. This was a myth but it was a very convenient myth, and this played out in a very powerful way in the rise of the right in the 1920s and 30s. Hitler and the Nazi party capitalized on rising resentment. The abolition of the treaty was a key platform for the party. Hitler also vowed to create Lebensraum, living space for the German people. Land lost in the treaty would be regained and more added. The ideological concept that Germany needed to expand its territory to thrive was not new when Hitler wrote about it in Mein Kampf. It's actually turn of the century, even late 19th century, thinking about empires. And this idea that the future belongs to those powers that have the great spaces, the mass populations, and the industrial resources at hand. But Hitler's belief that Germany's destiny lay in expanding its territory to the east could only be done through conquest. The implications of the Treaty of Versailles on Germany in the 1920s and 1930s are clear. But the Paris Peace Conference also had broader global implications, one of which was the formation of the League of Nations. The idea of collective security was thought to offer protection against war, a measure of protection against the possibility of another great war. The League was the brainchild of US President Woodrow Wilson, and he petitioned for its inclusion in the Treaty of Versailles. Woodrow Wilson put a great deal of faith in the League of Nations. He felt it would provide a way of settling disputes of nations of the world working together, and also providing collective security so that an attack on one member of the League of Nations would be seen as an attack on them all. And it was a very idealistic type of international institution, but I think there was strong support for it at the time. The League was established on the 10th of January, 1920. Despite popular support and President Wilson's enthusiasm for the League, opposition in Congress from those who did not want America embroiled in another European crisis meant that the United States never joined. Now, if the United States had joined the League of Nations, we'll never know, but the history of the 1920s and 1930s might have been a bit different. The League's ability to enforce collective security was tested repeatedly during the interwar years. One of the greatest tests it faced 
was Japan's invasion of Manchuria. The Eurocentric view of the Second World War is that it began in 1939. But war was being fought in the East long before Hitler invaded Poland. The invasion of Manchuria in 1931 was perhaps the first step on the long road to world war. Zara Steiner, the great historian at Cambridge, calls the period from 1929 to 1933 the hinge years. These are the years that make things different. The Japanese military move into Manchuria in 1931 in defiance of orders from their own civilian government, and the civilians are increasingly helpless to stop the Japanese militaries. Japan had a presence in Manchuria from the early 20th century, when victory in the Russo-Japanese War had secured for Japan control of the Liaodong Peninsula, and with it, the South Manchurian Railway. The neutrality of the area was also important to Japan, to serve as protection for their colonial interests in Korea, which Japan had formally annexed in 1910. The Manchurian incident began with an explosion along a section of the South Manchurian Railway on the night of September 18, 1931. The explosion was created as a pretext for invasion by officers of the Japanese Kwantung Army, acting independently from the authority of the government in Tokyo. It had been planned by two relatively junior officers, but within the space of about five to 10 days, they managed to occupy large parts of a region that is about the size of France and Germany combined. So this was really one of the most daring military actions that has been seen really in the 20th century. Now, many people asked, why didn't the international structures, why didn't the international community do more at that time? Why didn't the Americans take action or the British or the League of Nations? Lack of food is causing great starvation, and relief agencies give aid as best they can. Chiang Kai-shek, head of the nationalist government in China, offered limited resistance, believing the League of Nations would resolve the conflict. May I, for a few moments, recall to your mind the history of the present crisis. We do appeal to you. The League investigated and labeled Japan the aggressor, but the international community was not inclined to become actively involved. All of Europe's great countries had gone through a deeply traumatic and terrifying experience with war on their doorstep. The likelihood that they would threaten or go to war for a very far off country in East Asia, which they didn't regard as a serious ally, was something that I think at the time few politicians would have ventured. Japan rejected the League's censure and refused to return Manchuria to China. Japan However, find it impossible to accept the report adopted by the Assembly. In March 1933, Japan abandoned the League, clearly undermining its capacity for enforcing collective security. And there is an international kind of almost applause of what Japan is doing. When we look at international magazines, both British and Japanese, that deal with the idea of uh, imperial development or colonialism, there's constant British discussion of the excellent impact that Japan is having in East Asia. Manchuria, or Manchukuo, as it was renamed by the Japanese, who set up a puppet regime under China's last emperor, remained in Japanese hands until Japan's defeat in 1945. The invasion of Manchuria showed Japan and other aggressive nations that there would be minimal consequences for violating the League's rules. And that was dangerous, because Japan was not the only nation intent on expanding her borders in the 1930s. In October 1935, Italy invades Ethiopia and insists on doing it in a dramatically fascist fashion with a massive army and with the use of massively superior air force. The Italian invasion of Ethiopia, then known as Abyssinia, fulfilled what Benito Mussolini referred to as natural expansion. Il Duce believed Italy should be an imperial power. <laughs> 
and colonization of the independent Ethiopia offered a chance to build his empire. It also offered agricultural land in the country's fertile cotton-growing regions. It's possible, I think, to argue that when Mussolini decided to invade Abyssinia, Ethiopia, uh, and to conquer it as part of the Italian Empire, and the other powers failed to stop him, that this is a turning point, that, that once that's happened, you're on the march now to Japanese aggression, to German aggression, and so on, and you're on the march for the Second World War. The pretext for the invasion was an incident at Val in December 1934, when Somalis serving Mussolini fired on the Ethiopians. The Ethiopians returned fire, and this was Mussolini's casus belli for mobilizing his troops. Standing on a Roman balcony, Mussolini announced the invasion of Ethiopia on the 2nd of October, 1935. To our soldiers in East Africa who are about to start fighting, he sends a message. And Italy and the world knew that meant war. In Ethiopia, civilians quickly became targets. They were terrorized on the ground, as well as from aerial bombardments, which began within days of the opening of hostilities. Worse was to come. On December 26, 1935, Mussolini agreed to the use of poison gas. Before the year was out, villages had been drenched with mustard gas. Women and children, the frail and aged, were intentionally targeted. Their skin burned, livestock killed, and water supplies poisoned. Mussolini denied using gas against civilians. Mussolini claimed that the frightful wounds that the Ethiopians got from the poison gas, that it was just a form of leprosy, and they weren't really using poison gas against the Ethiopians at all. The trouble was that the democracies tended to connive because they didn't want to force the issue into a, a, a shooting war. In fact, we had retrieved from Ethiopia a canister of poison gas marked in Italian, so we knew exactly what was going on. And we therefore, as I say, in a sense colluded with uh, the Italian atrocities in Ethiopia. The more widespread use of gas against civilians in Ethiopia demonstrated that the moral boundaries protecting non-combatants were being obliterated. Unrestrained violence against civilians was becoming normalized. Civilians were fair game as part of military tactics and as the capital for callous retribution. And so in a way, it's the Ethiopian war, I think, that turns Mussolini into a bad dictator when lots of people in 1932 would have still thought, oh, well, for Italians, at least, he's a rather good dictator. In Addis Ababa, in February 1937, Italian army and fascist paramilitary forces rampaged through the city in retribution for an attempt on the life of the fascist governor, General Rodolfo Graziani. Which then produces a typical assault on the main sort of repository of Ethiopian history at a monastery called Deborah Labanos, where the Italians destroy the monastery, kill the monks, and burn the history. It's a classic example of Europeans saying, well, blacks can't have history, only Europeans have history, so bad luck. At home, Mussolini worked to mobilize the Italian economy for his war of civilization and liberation. One campaign called for wives to donate their wedding rings to the war effort. Many enthusiastically did. Queen Elena made a ceremony of donating her ring. Queen Elena inaugurates Italy's wedding ring day and exhorts the women of Italy to sacrifice their rings for the fatherland. Mussolini recognized that the need to mobilize the economy and win the support of the population at home were key elements of modern war. But Italy was far from being an industrial power of the first rank. And the mobilization of resources for the Abyssinian adventure and for involvement in the Spanish Civil War fatally undermined Mussolini's capacity to fight a total war in alliance with Hitler's Reich. The League of Nations condemned the Italian invasion 
but sanctions failed to make any real difference. The import of mules and camels was banned, but not cars and lorries. France and Britain tried to negotiate a plan with Ethiopia and Italy that would cede two-thirds of Ethiopia to Italy, but both parties rejected it. I think we need to remember that the great powers, in this case Britain and France, were imperial powers too. And it was quite hard for them to say to Mussolini, hang on, we've got big empires, but actually you can't have one. And they tried to stitch a deal with him so that he would have influence in Abyssinia and bits of territory and so on, because they were quite used to carving out parts of Africa in their own interest. The Abyssinia crisis, following Japan's invasion of Manchuria, further undermined collective security and the credibility of the League. When the Emperor Haile Selassie abandoned Ethiopia, he sought and was reluctantly granted asylum in London. He made an appearance at the League of Nations and was greeted by jeering Italian press and others who turned their backs in protest at his appearance. Finally, when the scene settled, he told those assembled, you abandoned us to Italy. This, he asserted, was a terrible precedent of bowing before force and a foreshadowing of things to come. It is us today, he told the League. It will be you tomorrow. I think we're so focused on Hitler in the 1930s, the impact he had on uh, other politicians, that we forget, I think, that Mussolini was, for many years, a much more important figure. He was a fascist dictator for 11 years before Hitler came to power. He was generally viewed in the 1920s and 1930s as a serious politician, and also a serious threat in some way. In May 1936, Mussolini announced victory to jubilant Italian crowds. Italy had destroyed primitive villages and intentionally targeted civilians with bombs and gas. It used war to expand its territory, draw on the agricultural resources of occupied land, and mobilize its own economy to support the war effort. Europe watched. As Mussolini was declaring victory in Abyssinia, Spain was falling into a brutal civil war that would profoundly affect the lives of civilians and prepare the path towards total war. The conflict, which grew from a failed military coup, was a complex struggle fought between centralism and regionalism, nationalism and republicanism, left and right, and authoritarian and libertarian viewpoints. It tore the country apart. What we can say in terms of the Spanish War and the international context is the Spanish Civil War was absolutely, in its origins, a Spanish war, a narrow domestic conflict. And that held good both for the origins and for maybe the first two weeks of the Civil War. And thereafter, Spain became a battlefield in an international war. Italy and Germany supported the nationalists. The Republicans found support in the Soviet Union. And both sides attracted adventurers, idealists and fanatics from all over the world. Most famously on the Republican side, in the form of the international brigades. Now, in terms of both Hitler and Mussolini, it's often said, you know, that what they did was ideological, you know, supporting another fascist, that it was also about experimenting with new military equipment, which to an extent it was. But the key thing that was behind the thinking of both of them was to undermine Britain and France. There were no simple alliances in this war, and everyone, including civilians, were both targets and potential enemies. One of the most terrible aspects of the Civil War is the arming of youth at a school age. The youngest rebel in arms is lionized by his fellows when he leaves hospital at Vergara. The crowd stands to attention with a fascist salute as the 14-year-old veteran healed of his wounds comes out to report for duty. The concept of a fifth column emerged in this war 
nationalist general Emilio Mola Vidal, moving on Madrid with his four-column army, described a fifth column of supporters already in Madrid undermining his opposition. The idea of fifth columnists later fueled fear and the persecution of enemy aliens in the Second World War. In Spain, savage reprisals against opponents and suspected opponents were carried out by both sides. Campaigns of fear and terror were intentionally employed. Threats of rape were broadcast over the radio, and those whose families had fled were killed. As nationalist forces moved through an area, anyone perceived as having shown loyalty to the Popular Front government was in danger. Left-wing parties in Madrid set up checkers, revolutionary tribunals that held trials of a sort, and shot those they convicted, hanging their bodies in the street. While on the right, nationalist purge committees executed those with liberal sensibilities. The war not only endangered the lives of civilians, it mobilized their labor and their homes. The defense of Madrid involved large-scale civilian mobilization, anticipating that which would be enacted in Leningrad and other cities during the Second World War. The community prepared for war. Women and children created barricades from rocks and stones. Buildings were requisitioned. Unions formed battalions. Outside the city, the government army digs itself in and prepares for the assault of the rebels. When the battle for the city turned to stalemate, the nationalists resorted to aerial bombardments. Almost all of the residential areas were bombed. It was an ultimately fruitless attempt to break morale, but a very instructive rehearsal for future action. As far as Hitler was concerned, his participation in the Spanish Civil War had been immensely beneficial. They'd managed to trial a number of military tactics which would be used in the Blitzkrieg in Poland first and then in, in France that had actually been used. I mean, the culmination, if you like, was Guernica. That's when it had all been trialed. The bombing of Guernica began with a single bomber on the afternoon of Monday, the 26th of April, 1937. The main church bell rang out in warning of the air attack. Refugees, troops, and the town's civilian population made their way to the refuges. The German Condor Legion had more firepower than all the air forces of the First World War combined. And one bomber from its experimental squadron wreaked havoc on the center of town. Once it had passed, people emerged from the shelters to help the wounded and were surprised when 15 minutes later, the full experimental squadron flew over, dropping its bombs. Then at 5.15, the town was carpet bombed by three squadrons operating in 20 minute relays for two and a half hours. Incendiaries blanketed the city in flames, as in the skies above, the precursor to the Luftwaffe rehearsed destruction for the war to come. A lot of military equipment, high-tech military equipment, had been tested in Spain. So for Hitler, the, the consequences were positive. As far as Mussolini was concerned, it was a much more complicated issue. At one level, he'd gained um, you know, the, the foreign policy and the propaganda triumphs, but at a huge cost. Italy had sent maybe 80,000 troops, there were a high number of casualties. It had used about half of its naval fleet and almost all of its, of its air force. Large amounts of equipment were left behind when the Italians left Spain. For the rest of the world, Spain offered a glimpse of the total war to come. It was a war fought with the labor of the people, marked by destruction that did not discriminate between combatant and non-combatant, battlefield and suburban street. The consequences of total war were also becoming clear. The situation for the hundreds of thousands of refugees who fled Spain was dire. France offered some asylum, but conditions in the hastily assembled camps were terrible. No running water or latrines, in some camps, refugees dug holes in the ground for shelter, 
the cost of supporting refugees was in the millions of francs per day. And the French government faced opposition from those opposed to admitting refugees. France faced a foreshadowing of the crisis that would overrun Europe at the end of the Second World War. In the Pacific too, a humanitarian crisis was unfolding. Japan's war against China paused following the annexation of Manchuria. In 1937, it flared catastrophically when Japan launched a full-scale invasion. World War II broke out on the 7th of July, 1937. This is not a date that European historians generally attribute to this event, but I think there is a very strong case that actually the Second World War began in Asia, and particularly with shooting between locally garrisoned Chinese and Japanese troops at a bridge called Lugotiao, known in the West as the Marco Polo Bridge. When ceasefire discussions failed, China mobilized for war against Japan, a war that would temporarily halt the civil war being fought between Chinese nationalists and communists, who came together to form a united front against invasion. I think it's fair to say that Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists were well aware that an invasion was very likely. And increasingly, in the mid-1930s, they had made preparations. However, they were significantly outnumbered and outgunned uh, by the Japanese. The Japanese had a huge advantage in terms of mechanized divisions, in terms of artillery, and particularly in terms of uh, air power. Japan hoped to move quickly to neutralize and contain the conflict in northern China. This worked initially. Beiping, as Beijing was then called, and Tianjin fell quickly after intense aerial bombardments. They expected it to be a quick lightning war that would probably end either with a collaborationist Chinese regime doing their will, or even a full-scale invasion and occupation of China. So they were greatly surprised and angered when the initial phase of fighting took rather longer than they had thought. Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the Chinese government, had never believed that a war with Japan would be quick or easy, and he had made plans for an extended, protracted war that would probably involve withdrawal into the interior of China for quite a long period of time until international assistance could be persuaded to come China's way. Chiang Kai-shek chose Shanghai as the place where he would make a stand against the Japanese. Once a small fishing village, by 1937, Shanghai had become a vibrant international center for commercial affairs. It was home to universities, European banks, and foreign-owned factories. On the 14th of August, Black Saturday, bombers of the Chinese Air Force set out to target Japanese naval assets, including the Japanese ship Izumo. But two pilots inadvertently dropped their bombs on the wrong targets, hitting one of the busiest civilian areas of the city. The Palace Hotel and the shopping district, Avenue Edward VII, were hit. The international settlement, thought to be safe, was a scene of destruction. Soon enough, Japanese aerial bombardment also began, with attempts to capture the city, leading to fighting on the streets. On the 20th of October, the international settlement suffered again when a Japanese bomb hit a tram car. The fighting in Shanghai demonstrated to the international community the indiscriminate nature of aerial warfare. International concession areas were not specifically targeted, but nonetheless suffered casualties. After further fighting around Suzhou Creek, and following the landing of a Japanese amphibious force at Hangzhou Bay, Cheng realized his troops could not hold the city. The fighting in Shanghai was terribly brutal. Japanese losses were about 40,000 uh, soldiers, and Chinese losses were probably around the 200,000 mark. But when the Japanese landed in Hangzhou, just south of Shanghai, they broke through the lines and advanced very, very quickly towards Nanjing. Nanjing, also known as Nanking, 
was a culturally significant city for China. Renowned for its architecture, it had been China's capital under numerous empires. And in 1937, was the nationalist capital under the leadership of Chiang Kai-shek. But cultural significance would offer no protection in total war. An awful lot has been written by Chinese, Japanese and Western scholars about the Nanjing Massacre. It really stands out as the most egregious example of Japanese atrocities in China, of which there are many. On the 7th of December, Cheng, recognizing the inevitability of losing the city, left for the country's interior. In the days leading to its fall, panic engulfed Nanjing. Residents fled to the public buildings and colleges in the designated safety zone in anticipation of the Japanese advance. The 12th of December was a clear and relatively peaceful day. Artillery was firing, but there were no air raids. But by nightfall, the city was in flames. The Chinese defense had buckled, and the defending troops had been given orders to abandon the city. Before leaving, the troops set many buildings alight, a common practice in total war. By the time the Japanese army entered the capital, it was already burning. When Japanese troops arrived, a new level of brutality and violence erupted. Getting from Shanghai to Nanjing was not particularly pleasant, so there is an argument that the brutality of war breeds further brutality and makes these actions more likely. I think it's fair to say that there was probably a breakdown in certain areas of Japanese command during the period. From the first hours until the middle of January 1938, the people of Nanjing endured unrestrained violence. Homes were repeatedly invaded. Women raped. Men suspected of being soldiers mutilated and killed. Corpses lined the streets. Few in the city were safe. One witness wrote that up to 1,000 women and girls were assaulted in one night. I think where we are with the Nanjing Massacre, as I think where we are with many other similar events around the world, is not perhaps to look at the massacre as a whole, but to think about why would a soldier or a group of soldiers commit certain actions? Because it's one thing to execute several thousand prisoners of war because you've been told to do so. It's another thing to go around raping women and killing children. In the Japanese case, I think there's an intersection of both ideology and a certain kind of military governance. The Japanese military were immensely powerful and had incredibly racist, denigratory attitudes towards the peoples of East Asia over which they were gradually annexing territory. Nanjing was a foretaste of the impact Japan's imperial ambitions would have on civilians in occupied territory as the war continued. It also demonstrated the influence the military had achieved over Japan's governing structures by 1937. It's important to remember, Japan's wars were part of a long-run expansion of Japanese influence throughout the East Asian uh, region. But over the course of the interwar period, as military control over Japan was increased and became more radicalized, and the willingness to give a military essentially abusive free reign over a civilian population did not seem problematic. Uh, and it didn't seem that it would threaten Japan's reputation in a modern wartime environment, in a world in which all the powers seemed willing to see war as encompassing these kind of strategies. There are no definitive casualty figures for the number of people who died in Nanjing. The scale of slaughter can only be tallied in estimates. Well, most scholars now would accept that between 200 and 300,000 people Died. The fact is, we will, we will never know. We simply don't have accurate records. 200 to 300,000 is the accepted figure. In Nanjing, the line between combatant and non-combatant was erased. Violence was used as a deliberate weapon of war against the civilian population 
an element of total war that would soon be employed elsewhere in the Asia-Pacific region and in Europe. After the fall of Nanjing, the Chinese nationalists moved to Wuhan. The Japanese advance through China continued, and by June 1938, the position at Wuhan was under threat. Considering his options for defense of the temporary capital, Chiang Kai-shek made a decision that profoundly affected the people of Hunan, Anhui, and Jiangsu provinces. He ordered the Chinese nationalist armies to breach the dikes of the Yellow River. They would use water instead of soldiers to defend the city. The floods that followed had been described as perhaps the single most environmentally damaging act of warfare in world history. It wasn't possible to warn the Chinese population in advance. Chiang Kai-shek was concerned that there were Japanese spies across the countryside. The flood eventually affected something like 54,000 square kilometers. It killed up to half a million people with four to five million refugees created by this flood. The diversion of the river delayed the Japanese advance, but it did not defeat it. The Chinese defense is resolute. This impedes but doesn't stop the Japanese who cross the stream, tanks and all. It bought the nationalist government time to withdraw and relocate its capital to southwest China in the city of Chongqing. Wuhan fell in October 1938. The flooding of the Yellow River shows the extent to which strategy can ignore the fate of civilians. The Sino-Japanese War previewed numerous aspects of the total war that Europe would experience. Another example is the bombing of Chongqing. As the Japanese advanced, people fled their homes in search of safety. Many fled to Chongqing, remote enough for Chang to have made it his capital. Remote, but not safe. If we want to see a place that best represents total war in China, Chongqing is, is, is probably that place. At the beginning of the war, the Japanese targeted factories, munitions, infrastructure. They were interested primarily in weakening the ability of the Chinese to respond to their attacks. When it became apparent that China was not going to surrender, that Chiang Kai-shek was not going to come to the negotiating table, and the war became more protracted, Japanese tactics changed and they embarked on the type of terror bombing that we see slightly later on in the war. The attacks on the 3rd and 4th of May, 1939, marked the beginning of a campaign of terror from the air. The estimates are throughout the whole period that Chongqing was under attack, something like 9,500 aircraft dropped over 20,000 bombs on the city, and something like 15,000 people were killed. The Japanese refined the strategy of Guernica in their strategic bombing raids. But where the bombing of Guernica lasted a day, Chongqing endured repeated attacks over a period of two years. Fear was amplified by incendiary bombs and delayed fuses, and it spread to Europe. In 1932, British Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin had spoken of the fear of the air, the direct threat to civilians that bombers posed. The bomber, he had famously said, will always get through. And it seemed that the experience of Madrid, of Guernica, Shanghai, and Chongqing proved Baldwin right. When people look today at newsreel footage or photographs of the war in China 
in its first two or three years, 1937 to 39. I think what might strike them is not so much its strangeness, but its familiarity. The city of Chongqing, the temporary capital of China, being bombed. The digging of trenches in the streets of Shanghai during the desperate battle for that city. The sending of refugees from the vulnerable cities to the interior. The eerie thing is, these things were happening in China before they happened in the West. And therefore, when we think about the experience that we associate with the war in the West, even something as iconic as the Blitz in London, we should remember that those experiences were not just shared in China, but often the Chinese were there first. When the Second World War broke out in Europe, many aspects of total war were already familiar. The Abyssinia Crisis, the Spanish Civil War, and the Sino-Japanese War had each acted as portents of the total war to come. The world had borne witness to terror bombing campaigns, unrestrained violence against civilians, to incalculable numbers of refugees displaced by war. Borne witness, and if it had not exactly shrugged its shoulders, it had resigned itself to one fact. This is what war now meant. As the 1930s wore on, and the inability of the League of Nations to maintain collective security became clear. Hopes for a lasting peace disintegrated. Mussolini took power. Stalin took power. Spain erupted. Hitler and the Nazi party rose to power. And Japan's imperial intentions became increasingly clear. Economies and populations across the globe began to mobilize for a war that the years between the wars had shown would be decided on the battlefield, and at sea, and in the cities, and in the factories and down the mines, and in the homes and classrooms, and on the streets, and on the farms. It would be total war. <laughs>